Francisco. And I am uh, on the leadership council of the emerging uh, first chapter of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments in California. And I'm on the national board and really delighted to be welcoming all of you uh, to this six hour program and uh, on chemicals in our everyday lives. I would like, let me see. Uh, we are going to be recording the sessions um, just so folks know I'll talk about that in a second, but just so you know that if you do say anything, um, they will be recorded for posterity. This today's program is uh, sponsored by the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and co-sponsored by Service Employees International Union, the Nurses Alliance. This is a, uh, a union that represents many kinds of service workers, but also specifically work um, represents nurses. Many of the public health nurses in California are represented by SEIU, as well as several large hospitals, um, including San Francisco General. Um, I'd like to tell you about the uh, another upcoming event that we're going to be having. This is the fourth in our series on general environmental health issues. All of our previous ones were fully recorded. And um, the first one was on climate change. The second one was on air pollution and fires. The third was on food and agriculture. And, um, and we also have a series that we're doing with the, the California chapters of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses on farm worker health and safety. Those are just one hour programs in the evening once a month. The next one is going to be July 28th. We also have a set of um, policy and advocacy training programs that are going to be starting in the near future. And uh, Pat Bacalian will be sending anybody who's on this, has registered for this, will get announcements for all of these different programs. But Catherine and Pat will be um, co-facilitating the policy and advocacy program. And anybody who wants to really make change at a legislative or regulatory perspective, that is gonna be a, a great program for you to um, either hone your existing skills or begin to understand how we shift policy. So really encourage you to participate in those. Um, today's program goes from nine to three. We are only going to be doing 15 minute breaks. So what I would really encourage you to do is some of the time while you're listening to the program, stand up and move around while you're listening in the same way that you would listen to the radio in your room and be doing things. Um, a little tiny bit of multitasking is not a problem. Um, definitely want to not sit for all six hours for sure. Um, we will be recording in one hour intervals um, so that uh, if you, if something was really of interest and you wanna to listen to it again, you'll be able to just pull that part out. Uh, also, if you're an academic or you do any kind of teaching in your clinical settings and wanted to share a particular hour at perhaps a green bag lunch event or something of the sorts, you'll be able to do that. A total of six units of continuing education will be offered to those of you who when Pat Bacalian, who is the person in the fish tank here that you can see in the box, mm -hmm. um, Pat Bacalian is the person that has really helps to keep um, all of the bits together. And one of the big important bits is you getting your continuing education credits. She will be in a, a few days, she'll be sending you the post-test. If you fill out the post-test, send it back, give her a few days, she'll have them graded, and then you'll be getting a certificate. Your certificate will have a blank for your name. You need to fill that blank out, and then you can use that for your continuing education needs for relicensure. Re um, just quickly, some other ways that you can engage in addition to things I just told you. If you are not signed up for National Annie's newsletter and information, um, the website is there and we'll put these websites into the chat so that you can link on them. Um, so the www.envirn.org, that's where you can get national news. 
There is also, for those of you who are interested, a climate a nurses climate challenge um, that is uh, provides all kinds of information um, and allows you to join a cadre of nurses around the country that are helping nurses to learn more about climate change. And I think that is it for me. And um, what I'm going to do now is introduce our next speaker. So Catherine, if you'd like to upload your, I stopped sharing, upload your first slide. Um, I just want to, Sharima is also on. She's one of our, um, our speakers later on in the program and uh, she's waving to us now. Uh, we wanna just thank all the speakers who are speaking today. They are, um, they are doing this pro bono. They're doing this for free uh, for nurses, for our edification. And we just so appreciate every single one of them. I'm gonna introduce them as they come along. So the first speaker we're delighted to have is Catherine Dodd, who has been working on chemical policies for a very long time. Uh, particularly from a pol policy perspective. She's currently a consultant on environmental health and policies, um, the policy advisor to our emerging chapter, California chapter on the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And she has been very active in Sacramento on both legislation and regulations this year. Until 2017, she directed the San Francisco um, health service system where she was responsible for over 117,000 public employees and their, and their dependents. And in that role, she drew attention to and took action when it was discovered that San Francisco women firefighters had much higher incidence of breast cancer than women in office work situations. And that in, initiated a longitudinal study um, that continues today to look at different kinds of chemicals, particularly PFAS, which she's going to, I'm sure, talk about in firefighting foam and breast cancer. And an extension of that study is now being done with nurses at UCSF looking at theirs. So Catherine helped to initiate a cascade of wonderful events there. Prior to that, she was the deputy chief of staff for Mayor Newsom, responsible for health and human services involving a, a range of services from human, human trafficking programs, aging services, and environmental health, um, and addressing the social determinants of health. She has a BS and an MS from UCSF School of Nursing and a PhD in sociology, and she's an, a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. She was also, and this is really important to um, distinguish her, she was the district chief of staff for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and President Clinton appointed her to the Region 9 to be the Region 9 Director of Health and Human Services under Donna Shalala. Um, and she was responsible for many states and um, six Pacific Island jurisdictions. She also worked for two members of the Boards of Supervisors. And she currently holds a number of various leadership and advisory positions. Um, and, um, and she was on the board of the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners for nearly a decade. And we're going to have Sharima, who is currently from the Breast Cancer Prevention Partnerships. They work together closely. Um, and she also has, in the last couple of years, become quite expert in radio frequency, radiation, and electromagnetic radiation. And, um, and it, we hope to do a, a session actually just on that and on, the, on what we do know about the significant emerging and existing uh, literature on that. And so with that, a uh, long introduction, um, Catherine, um, please go ahead and start. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. That was a long introduction. And I've stopped the chemicals from rolling because they make me, <laughs> they make me dizzy. Um, so I'm so glad that so many people are here today. I'm going to uh, I'm going to see how I can advance my slides. There we go. Whoops, back. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about dangerous toxic chemicals. Um, these signs should actually be everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and I want to start by talking a little bit about um, a body burden. And each one of us has a body burden of synthetic chemicals. Uh, that means they're not natural chemicals. We also have some 
natural occurring chemicals. Um, some of them are metabolized and leave our body in our urine. Some are what that we call forever chemicals, um, which are often lipophilic. They stick around in our, our fat cells. Um, and you, if you lose weight and you lose fat cells, they just concentrate. Um, but what's important is that all of them can mix and interact with each other. Uh, so we're literally a chemical soup with all these chemicals interacting as we're exposed to them and absorb them. Um, and then of course they interact with any pharmaceuticals that, we're, um, that we take. Uh, but what's key is that none of them belong in our bodies. So I'll just give a little story. In 2005, I was working for Speaker Pelosi and, they, and Commonweal, which is an um, incubator for environmental health, science, wellness, cancer, help, anyway, in Northern California, um, was doing research and continues to do research on biomonitoring because Congresswoman Pelosi was gonna introduce legislation in the Appropriations Committee to get um, funding for biomonitoring. And so she was supposed to get biomonitored. And she called me the night before and said, Catherine, how much blood are they gonna take? Well, I had no idea. <laughs> and so um, I said, oh, probably three or four vials. And she said, you know, I don't feel comfortable with this. I have to give a big talk at noon and which I had written the speech for. So I knew that. And she said, so you have to find someone else. This is at nine o'clock at night. So I set about calling, you know, everyone I knew who was kind of a, a name, named person uh, and couldn't find anyone. So I called uh, Commonwealth back and said, you know, I'm really sorry. They said, well, can you do it? So I agreed to do it. And these are my results from 2005. And I was only, um, we only tested five chemicals at that time. But as you can see uh, in the pesticide area, um, uh, <clears throat> the uh, DDT and DDE were above the median. And the median is an N of like 16. So it wasn't, we don't really, there's no normal, um, but in the group that I was tested with, I, I had much more of that. So uh, I was born in 1956, DDT was banned in 1965, um, yet it's still floating around in my body. Um, uh, my flame retardants um, were above the median. Uh, my most of my PFAS chemicals, which are um, perfluorochemicals, which you'll hear more about, were above the median, um, and all but one was very high. Uh, and then my phthalates, most of them were elevated. So when I got these results back, it piqued my interest in this topic, and I've continued to be interested in it ever since. I also want to point out another nurse, Charlotte Brody who is one of the founders of Healthcare Without Harm and her body burden study, she was, this is much more recent because uh, it's very expensive to do these. So she was tested for uh, 214 chemicals and 87 were found. Um, these are the categories they fall in, um, 52 of them cause cancer. Um, but, and as we talk about chemicals today, there'll be a lot of talk about cancer, but it's important to point out that um, uh, brain and nervous system and reproduction, you know, there are a lot of other biological uh, issues that chemicals cause. So this was another um, research project with 12 doctors and eight nurses, 62 chemicals were tested for. Um, and uh, BPA, which you'll hear more about, which is um, bisphenol A, it's an endocrine disrupting chemical, a reproductive toxicant. Um, it's implicated in breast and prostate cancer and brain function and obesity, um, thyroid dysfunction. Uh, so those were found. I mean, I think if you look, it started with BPA, then it went to the PIFOA class, um, which is, an, a, you'll hear more about PFAS, uh, the chemical of the day. It's an immunotoxicant. It's implicated in fetal development, all of these things. Phthalates I already spoke about, um, reproductive disorders, preterm birth. Um, PBDE is a known neurotoxicant. Uh, 
kind of scary and triclosan, which is one of my favorites, um, is a pesticide uh, that's an endocrine disrupting chemical, has car cardiac effects, et cetera. Um, and Perfect. we'll talk more about that as well. So none of these toxic chemicals belong in our blood or urine or hair. They actually tested hair when I had it done. Um, we find pesticides, phthalates, which phthalates are plasticizers, industrial degreasers, solvents, flame retardants, heavy metal, dioxin, and furans, all circulating in our blood at this time. They're circulating in our blood and in our, in our developing fetuses. They're circulating, um, be, the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, formerly Breast Cancer Fund, did research on cord blood. The chemicals were found in cord blood. They're found in babies. They're found in breast milk. So where do these toxic exposures come from? They come from the air. They come from water. They come from soil. They come from food, from food packaging, from cookware. And I'm need to move my screen um, from personal care products um, and cleaning products and pesticides um, and probably a whole host of other places. Um, I'm wondering if I can, let me just do that. Uh, if you just look at this slide and then we're gonna break into small groups. So think about as you look at this, um, what you came into contact with so far today. Um, you probably weren't doing any work on your car, um, but did you come into any herbicide and um, animal repellent? Uh, did you use toothpaste or makeup or uh, antiperspirant? Uh, have your, are your kids playing with any kinds of arts and crafts if you're at the office? Um, I love this one where it says ink, toner, correction fluid. When was the last time we used correction fluid? Uh, at any rate, um, but in your home, do you have one of those plug-in fragrances? Uh, do you use bleach to clean with? Um, um, other kinds of uh, dish soap, other kinds of cleaning products. And then in your lar yard, your swimming pool, Fertilizer, pesticides, um, we probably haven't done hope maintenance today, but pet care, um, we're actually doing in California a new review of flea and tick control, um, kitty litter, stain and odor remover, etc. So now I'm going to ask Barb, um, Dr. Sattler, to break us into groups of four and to make a list of some of the things you might have come in contact with today or yesterday, it's early today. Um, that had chemicals in them that may or may not be dangerous. Uh, and just if one person in your group will keep the list when we come back, we'll put them in the chat um, and just see how exposed we've been today. Barb, do you want to break us out? Sorry, yes, I'm going to do that. And Catherine, just so you know, there's a radio or a TV or something in your background that we're hearing. Yeah, that's actually Mary on another conference call. I will try and ask her to speak more quietly. <laughs> okay. Or maybe move to another room. Um, not okay. possible where we are right now, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Okay. Okay, I've opened all the rooms. So people need to just click that they are going to the rooms. How long did you want them to be in the breakout room? Um, Can you hear me, Pat? Yeah, I can hear you. We, I don't see Catherine any longer. Maybe yeah. she went to a breakout room. Were you assigned a breakout room, Pat? 
Um, I think so. Oh, you don't have to go. I just want to make sure it came up on the screen and said, go to breakout room because you have to say yes. Oh, I didn't see that I, that was the case, but I'll check. And also Catherine didn't tell me how long she wanted them in the breakout room. I'm sure just a couple minutes. It okay. won't take that long. She's got a lot of slides. Okay. I'm just gonna give them a couple more minutes. Yeah. But I don't, do you see Catherine? Can you just go through the? I, I don't see her. Did she go off? She went off, yeah. Okay, I have to make sure she goes back on. Fun technology, huh? <laughs> Uh, Catherine's in a breakout room. Oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to call the breakout rooms back. Okay. Okay. Great. Perfect. It will give them a notice at 60 seconds. They'll be brought back in. I saw that we had 106 participants. That's right, we did. It's yeah. wonderful. It's terrific. Hey, Barbara, uh, this is Elaine Hanna. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Hi. <laughs> I got disconnected. I was in room four with Nancy. Uh -huh. and, uh, I don't know what happened, but I, I lost my connection. Can we you... are calling everybody back in. Oh, you the are. Room. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's back in the okay, main room now. Yeah. Thanks. And um, Catherine, uh, I think you need to reshare your screen so we can get back with your PowerPoint. Well, it says I'm sharing my screen. There we go. There we go. And did you want to? Um, I was going to ask people to put what they came up with in their small group into the chat box in terms of what exposures you might have already had today. And I'm trying to find the chat box. Yeah, I can I can help with that. Um, Morgan yeah. Park said their list was toothpaste, laundry detergent, bleach, hand sanitizer, air freshener, dish soap, deodorant, uh, leave-in conditioner, and a lot of personal care products. Uh, Stacen uh, mentioned flea and tick medicine, um, potting soil with chicken manure, more personal care. <laughs> Elaine um, said coffee couple of others, coffee, makeup, um, painting and pesticides, uh, group six added, um, also personal care, a lot of personal care products. Of course, it's first thing in the morning for us out in California, the cat box, uh, Tilex, nonstick pan, uh, plastic containers, uh, let's see, trying to get the mold and grout 
and um, sunscreen specifically, plant spray. Air and, freshener. Oh, there you go. You're seeing it now. I wasn't sure what you yeah. That's okay. Keep going. And uh, I think a lot of cleaning supplies and personal care products, and then a few pet supplies, candles, Stacy Road, important one, especially if they are fragrant candles. So I think you have a really good list that people um, made from, uh, from their- So list. we'll go on then, but uh, you can see how easily it is to be exposed. And let me- and I just put, it's not as though we're only exposed through what goes into our mouth, but I love this slide because essentially it's all going into our body, all of those pollutants. Um, we are, this is one of Barb's slides, we are what we eat, drink and breathe and slather on our bodies. Um, you think of uh, on the left side, clothing, um, and the plastic bags that go over clothing, uh, the, some of the clothes have stain resistance in them, um, gasoline, uh, our, our food, our meat, um, industrial exposures from the air pollution, um, and we mentioned breast cancer, uh, breast milk before. So this is a hard slide to read, but um, your body burden is your toxic chemicals that build up in your body over time. Um, and we mentioned cosmetics, face and skin care. We mentioned shampoo and conditioner, hair styling products. One in particular is hair straightening products or detangling products, perfumes and fragrances, deodorant, body lotion, uh, shaving cream and gel. Um, there's an incredible video that um, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners showed on um, that new men's aftershave axe which has too many secret ingredients, but is making people sick. Um, oils and bath salts, laundry detergent, those little pink uh, things you put in the dryer, uh, bubble bath, shower gel. And we're not just exposing ourselves to all these, we're exposing our kids and they, they become a body burden. Uh, they're a burden um, that act much like Pharmaceuticals do, they can be absorbed and transported to the parts of the body where they'll be most influential. They can be metabolized into a more reactive agent or they can interact with other metabolized chemicals. They can mimic or block hormones, um, which is called, which means they're an endocrine disrupting horm um, chemical. They can interact with gene expression and be expressed not necessarily in your body, but in your next, in the next generations body. And they can interfere with sensitive periods of fetal development, which we'll hear more about later. I just wanted to remind us that the, the endocrine system is, um, is, is more than just our, uh, our reproductive system. You know, the pancreas is part of the endocrine system. All of these um, organs are secrete hormones. Um, and one of the key classifications in chemicals is endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. We'll talk more about them. So your exposure to chemicals, um, a lot of it depends on your life stage, which I said, we, um, I think Karen is addressing that. Your, some of it um, relates to your genes. Um, Much of it is our societal factors, institutionalized racism, um, our built environment, social stress, and then the mixtures of low doses of chemicals. I just want to go back to you know our chemistry in nursing school, where they said the dose makes the poison. So you know, I used to, when my dog ate one candy bar, it was like no big deal. But when the dog got into a whole pound of um, chocolate chips, it was a big deal. So the dose made the poison, um, and that's true for us in terms of pharmaceuticals as well. But when we're looking at uh, chemical exposures, they can be very tiny exposures, but they're over time and they don't leave your body. And we're finding that that low dose actually has a very increased adverse effect long before it ever reaches what's known in the um, toxicology world um, is the um, 
and I'm forgetting uh, the observed adverse effect level um, or the OAEL. And that's, you know, would be the EPA would say, well, this is what we're going to look for. And then as the dose goes up, you're, you see an effect go up. But what we need to do is look way before that at, at much smaller doses. I wanted to put this up because um, I'm hoping that it'll draw attention <laughs> to, um, to the chemicals in our, in our environment. And this, was, it, this is a great, a really wonderful um, workshop that you can, if you go to Collaborative on Health and the Environment and the, um, it's www.healthandtheenvironment.org. There's a new um, paper out by Shauna Swan and it looks specifically at men's reproductive health and talks about our declining sper sperm count and our increasing infertility. And she had this one slide that kind of explained it all. So this is these are possible causes of infertility, but they're also possible causes of all the things we're gonna talk about today. That there's the environment, yes, there's lifestyle factors, but there are chemical exposures, um, others and EDCs, and all the ones at the bottom are endocrine disrupting chemicals. So it's, it shows you just how prevalent they are. So we, we want you to um, search your own personal care products and cleaning products. This is one of Barb's slides. Um, and you know, when I first saw this, I thought bounty, bounty paper towels have chemicals in them. Yes, they do. And those little Mr. Clean cleaning pads, all of those have dangerous chemicals in them. Um, so, I, my goal is to give you places to go to find information. So you'll be hearing from um, Sharmina from the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. Sharima, I'm sorry. Um, they have a whole section on Get the Facts Safe Cosmetics. And when I was on the board, um, that was kind of the, the program we launched. Uh, they've done many more programs since then. Uh, as well as sponsored legislation at the state and federal level. Um, but just when we talked about cosmetics this morning, um, you've got heavy metals. And if you use a foundation, you've got um, ethanol, ethanol, ethanolmine compounds, if you use blush, toluene, if you use nail polish, sunscreen, um, which is really important now that we're in the summer months. That triclosan, that pesticide is in your deodorant. It's also in your toothpaste. Um, you also find triclosan uh, in socks. You find it in those rubber liners for sinks. Um, body lotion has parabens and someone mentioned candles in the chat room. Um, parabens uh, are, are part of um, candles as well. Uh, the Breast Cancer Prevention Fund did a really important research project early on fi finding lead in lipstick and got a lot of media coverage over it. Um, mascara, shampoo, you name it. Um, that's just the cosmetics. Um, we haven't even talked about all the other places you're exposed. So another really valuable resource is the Environmental Working Group. And we're going to, I think, talk more about that later. Um, but their Skin Deep website, you can put in your product or you can put in the name of a chemical um, and it'll tell you what's in it. Um, I, I'm particularly, um, I want to point out again, the uh, sunscreen, but also bug repellent um, and, and then the fragrances for men. But this is another very valuable website. And I think the advice is, and they, EWG makes little cards up that say, what are the most dangerous things? And if you go to the website, you can order them. Um, the advice is don't use anything that has more than five chemicals that you can't pronounce. Um, preferably no more than one chemical that you can't pronounce. Um, EWG breaks their, um, their areas of research into uh, these, and I'm, I'll just point out the cleaning supplies and cookware and food containers. Uh, and I'll talk about those at the very end today in terms of cookware. Um, but if you click on one of these, it'll take you to the, to the classification of chemical and it'll tell you what they are and you can put chemicals in and find out um, what, what's in them and what, what's dangerous about them. 
This is another really valuable resource and we'll hear from someone from the Green Policy Institute um, later. Um, and I just wanted you to have these resources. I know we're gonna talk about pesticides, but it's been an area of focus for um, California Annie. Um, and you know that the California uses over 800 tons of pesticides um, each year. And, and we don't even let people know we're gonna do it um, is just a travesty. We should be banning them all. I wanna make special note, this is my pet peeve of glyphosate, <clears throat> which it, we need to ban it in industrial use or in agricultural use, but we also need to eliminate it from our own gardens. Um, it's a, it's a possible, possible car, probable carcinogen to humans, according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, and, and I'll just say that I'm part of a lawsuit against glyphosate because I ha had a rare form of lymphoma uh, that's linked directly to glyphosate or Roundup called mantle cell lymphoma. Um, uh, Annie nationally is uh, signed on to an amicus brief about glyphosate in California because they, they do not want it listed on what's called our Prop 65 list. So um, Annie is active in this, in this area. I wanna, because we just went from pesticides, I wanted to talk about briefly about our foods. Um, you all heard the recent uh, news about the um, heavy metals in baby foods. Um, I mean, that took congressional action to draw attention to it. Um, again, we can find in our foods bisphenol A, dioxins, PCBs, lead, mercury, cadmium. Um, and I'll just say a thing um, for a moment about lead. You know, it in Europe, they knew it was dangerous in, in 1926. We didn't admit it was dangerous till 19, I think it was 67 in the United States. And in California, we didn't do anything about it till the late 70s. <clears throat> and we're still allowing it to be in our pipes. Um, you're gonna do this later today, what's on your food. And, uh, and that's, I think I've ended early, <coughs> which is rare for me. So there's time for questions. Um, I didn't go into each one of the chemicals um, I, and I'm hoping we'll spend more time, especially on PFAS, but that's in, um, at the, when I talk at the end, but other speakers will probably talk on PFAS as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing, or I'm gonna to try to stop sharing once I close that. I think way up on top. Way up on top, start video, that would be me. Hmm. Well, that's okay, I'll let you, I'm gonna just facilitate Q&A. Great. While, while you, um, if you hover on top, there should be a place where it says stop sharing. So I, um, I, I think that we could, uh, if you wanted to do one of two things, you could put your hand up. And if you go down to the bottom right and hover under reactions, um, one of the reactions you could have is putting your hand up and I'll try and look for those. Um, the other is um, that you can write your questions in, uh, in the um, chat and we'll look at those. And Pat, if you could keep an eye on uh, the hands up kind of scrolling through, that would be hugely helpful because there are 106 of us. Um, can you talk about the flea and tick medicine for dogs? Um, Catherine, would you take that on? So there's an, um, there's an ingredient, not in the flea and tick medicine that dogs take orally, but in the ones that are in the flea collars. And it, I believe it's called PERC, but I'm not, I don't have it at the top of my head. We're trying to get it listed in California as part of the pesticides um, and ask that it be researched. Um, you know, all of these issues are environmental justice issues. And uh, you know, every single place we looked, uh, communities of color live on the they they live on the front lines, or they live on what's called the fence lines. And in terms of flea and tick medication, the oral flea and tick medication is very expensive. So low-income folks who have animals tend to buy those collars, 
which are dangerous um, for for humans as well as well probably as um, dogs. But I think um, uh, I, I'm sorry I don't have more information specifically on it. We can send that out with a post test. Um, we can, can I just share um, that many of those uh, flea and tick. Um, little oils that you put on the back of dogs and cats necks, they prevent reproduction. That's so they are reproductive toxicants. And if you read the advertisements on them, it says, you know, keep your kids away for several days. Well, hello, any of you have dogs and kids? That's like not a possibility, right? So sometimes their instructions are ridiculous in terms of how to protect ourselves. But just to note, if something is a reproductive toxicant to, to a bug or a rodent, or then they are reproductive toxicants. And, um, and very often we've been finding that they also can create risks for humans. And again, it's not the dose. It's not like you're putting a flea and tick collar around your neck. It's that you're being exposed to it day after day after day and absorbing it. I'm looking at the... Um, questions uh, and the first one was for there did, were you supposed to get handouts you'll you'll get copies of the slides if you'd like them from all the speakers um, someone makes their own soap and detergent we should publish that recipe um, and uh, that Shauna Swan slide was from her new book from the presentation on her new book I highly recommend that presentation it's pretty scientific um, and let's see what else her new book, uh, I think it's called Countdown, correct? Yes. Um, just talks about the decrease in, steady decrease in sperm counts over the decades. And her predictions are actually that we're going to have worldwide gross male infertility in the future if we keep going in this direction. Um, as insect-borne insect -born illnesses increase due to climate change, um, now appearing in the areas in the past have not been an issue. How do we speak to addressing the balancing for human and environmental health? Barb, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, we talked actually quite a bit about this in climate change. And so um, for those of you who are interested in looking at what's going on with vector-borne illnesses, I would suggest that um, that's the area where we talk about it a fair bit, but you're absolutely right. With climate change, what we're seeing is that many of the vectors that were in more tropical areas, if you're in the United States, are now creeping up into our southern states. Um, we've now detected insects, uh, mosquitoes that carry malaria in almost every state at this point. We're seeing you know, some of that. And um, some of the things like rats that carry hantavirus, their domain is increasing. Um, and, and so all of those kinds of things are shifting. And the other thing that's shifting is the relative toxicity of some of our plants like poison ivy and poison oak, um, meaning that those chemicals are actually getting stronger with climate change because we're having these larger growing seasons um, and shifting growing season. So um, there was also, um, Catherine, a question about the uh, cookware. Would you like to take a moment and talk about that? Because that's of interest to a lot of people, I think. Sure. Mo I remember getting my first nonstick fry pan um, oh so many years ago. Uh, and it was created by Teflon. Um, it, it's coated with... Um, a PFAS chemical. It's a fluoridated chemical. And what they do is they keep changing the chemical makeup. So once you try and ban one, then they change the chemical makeup a little bit and you have another one. Um, if you haven't, uh, definitely uh, go to Netflix and watch um, Dirty Waters with Mark Ruffalo um, and or The Devil We Know, which are both um, documentaries about um, the DuPont Teflon plant um, and what it did to the people who, who lived on the river near that plant. Um, 
So uh, PFOS, it, it, the coating, it, it, it's, it, it keeps grease from, from sticking or it keeps things from sticking to pans. Um, and it's got to be too, too good to be true. I don't know why we just adopted it so readily, but it uh, it's seeps into your food. Um, it's this stain resistant, water resistant repellent kind of thing is also on, on uniforms. It's on um, out, gear you wear outside. Um, I think Patagonia is the only company that um, makes a promise to not use uh, PFAS chemicals in their in their um, clothing. Um, did I answer the question? It's 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 a bad chemical. It's a forever chemical. It stays in your body. Um, it's associated with all kinds of um, illnesses, including it decreases your uh, response to vaccines in children. Um, but liver disease, it's an endocrine disrupting chemical. So all the organ, all your endocrine receptors. Um, I think you meant to say it decreases immunity, the, the immunity with the vaccines. Thank yeah. you. I did. Um, so, uh, and I'm sure that more people will be talking about it as we go forward, but it's kind of the chemical um, du jour. They used to say that BPA was the everywhere chemical, um, bisphenol A, um, which is, you know, in water bottles and it's in plastic resins. Um, it, it, BPA is actually a synthetic estrogen. Um, in, in, at Stanford Hospital, the nurses there realized that they were feeding babies out of plastic bottles that had BPA in them. Um, and they actually got the hospital to change. Um, uh, it's in our IV bags uh, and it leaches into whatever's inside it. So you think of those hundreds of crates of water bottles on an airplane tarmac in the sun um, that are just leaching, you know, they're just absorbing the water's just absorbing the BPA. So um, BPA was called an everywhere chemical and, and bis, uh, PFOS is today's everywhere chemical. 99% uh, of the population has PFOS um, some in, in your body. Um, and again, it, 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 you don't need, you don't need a lot, but you just keep those continuous exposures, um, over time. I think, um, someone's asking about supplies in terms of drywall and flooring and ceilings. Um, one of the most significant things is the off gassing, um, of, of carpets and, um, and again, PFOS is in a lot of carpets because it's a stain resistor. Uh, but the vinyl floors, vinyl is a petrochemical. And um, it's not like you're, I guess if your babies are climbing, are crawling around on old vinyl floors, those can be dangerous. But if you're putting in new ones, look for healthier alternatives. I think um, um, if I could just interject one of the chemicals that is a known carcinogen is formaldehyde. And formaldehyde continues to be in press board, and many of the um, many of the building products that we use. It's it's a some of them are cheaper alternatives to using solid wood, um, and so those off gas uh, into uh, homes as well. And there was a, a huge issue around that after Katrina when FEMA built quickly built all of these trailers and sent them down as temporary housing. <laughs> And they made them out of press board and the formaldehyde off gassed into the um, into these temporary housing and made people ill. Um, so formaldehyde is a big indoor air contaminant and um, one of the ones to be concerned about. The other thing, if I could just, if you don't mind. And it's Catherine. also one, the formaldehyde. Go ahead. I think you froze, Catherine. I was just going to say the formaldehyde is also in nail polish, and we expose those wonderful people who do our pedicures to them every day. Um, one of the questions was, do labels actually say lead, mercury, et cetera? That's one of the issues, is that there's no requirement that there, there be labeling of what chemicals are in products. Um, that's a major issue. Um, I just want to scroll down. Are there good companies? 
Hopefully someone else can answer that question um, about where to buy things. Um, uh, in terms of the clinic, the Healthcare Without Harm and our greening webinar, we'll talk about clinics and hospitals and um, how we can pick safer products. Um, uh, essential oils. Oh, there, it's a, it's a, we can use that for ticks and... Um, what about the green pan? Um, boy, I don't know about the green pan, but I bought one. <laughs> um, but I also have a ceramic pan, which does require a little more scrubbing. You know, it's, you know, but you don't want to scrub with dish soap that's dangerous. So it's, it's tough. Um, the green pan, a ceramic pan? It doesn't say so on the label. Um, and we'll talk later about legislation in California to label our pans. But um, here's a question. Do we need to filter our tap water in San Francisco? Unfortunately, yes. San Francisco has some of the best tap water um, in the country. It comes directly from, from snowmelt in Hetch Hetchy and is, goes 55 miles down to San Francisco. But um, we have noticed the pickup of arsenic and other things. Um, and if you're working with pregnant women, they should definitely um, filter their water. And um, I'm, we can perhaps, there's some really good suggestions um, on, on the CHE because health of different kinds and prices of filters, because um, not everyone can afford them. Um, uh, poison ily, ivy. Um, I, it's hard for me to scroll down these. So Barb, help me if you would. Sure. I just, I could, I I'd just like to say something about this notion of forever chemicals. These are just so folks understand, these are chemicals that are so tightly bound as molecules that they don't break down. They don't ever break down. Hence the notion of forever chemicals. So when they get in our air, they get in our lungs, they get in our body, even if we excrete some of them in our urine or in our feces, it goes to sewage treatment plant, which in turn treats, but they remain intact because even in our sewage treatment plants, even in our water, drinking water plants, they can't, they don't break them down. And so they wind up back in our water, they wind up in our fish, we eat the fish, we then get them back in our body again. So these forever chemicals are in our environment forever. We do not, which is why it's so important as we move towards green chemistry and other kinds of chemicals that will break down eventually. And yet that can create products that we need, building supplies and hospital supplies and so forth. So just wanted to, expand on that a tiny bit. Well, and they also end up in our fish, which we eat in many low-income communities are um, sustenance fisher people or fisher families. Um, and so they're being exposed again from another place to PFAS chemicals. Um, I just saw a really great, whoops, that's the wrong screen. Um, a great question in the chat. Cast iron is always great because you're picking up some iron. Um, beware of marketing products. The bottom line is not health. Sometimes we call that the in in the environmental movement we call it greenwashing. You know, they'll say like essential oils. Well, they're anything but oils. They're, if you look at herbal herbal essence um, shampoo and you look that up on one of the sites that I've shown you, it's full of chemicals. Um, what do you think about fluoride water filter? Uh, we had a, have, have, did we already do the, the fluoride in the water workshop, Barb? Um, I've attended some and I can't remember whether they were from this, but did you want me to say something about fluoride? Go ahead, that's good. Yeah, so fluoride, uh, we have a, a couple of nurses within Annie that have been doing uh, a literature review on the fluoride, um, on the scientific peer-reviewed fluoride literature. And um, what's interesting is that on the CDC's website, none of the new literature, in fact, none of it from the last 10 or 20 years has been included in what the CDC shows. And yet some of the newer literature does show that uh, fluoride can have some effects 
on, um, on reproduction and, um, it, and birth defects. And we, as Annie, the Alliance Nurse for Healthy Environments, uh, have written a letter to the CDC saying minimally that the CDC should at least have the, all of the literature, all of the scientific literature on their website and the most current literature so that health departments and others can make decisions about fluoridation of water. It's very, it's one of those things that gets politicized very, very quickly. But as nurses, uh, we need to be just looking at the scientific literature. We need to look at the toxicology and the epidemiology and make public health decisions from that perspective. So in terms of filtering your water, one of the things that is really important is to know what are you filtering out? What's in your water that you're trying to get out? Because Filters are not filters are not filters. So some filters are gonna filter out particulate matter. Some are gonna filter out organic matter. You know, the charcoal ones are good at the organic matter. But um, if you have heavy metals, there may be a different filter. And so you really need to know what is in your water that you're trying to get rid of and then appropriately choose the filter. Reverse osmosis takes everything out of your water. You then wind up with almost like distilled water. Um, but then we need certain minerals and things that are important that in our water generally. So you may need to then replace some minerals um, so there, it's not, I wish it was just so simple, but it's not, it's a bit complex. And as nurses, we're used to complexity and we're used to having to make decisions by taking in the science and taking in information. I think we have just a couple of minutes more. Catherine, are there some things that you wanna make sure people um, hear? Would you like to say something about regrettable substitutes, Catherine? Um, <clears throat> sure. I, I just put in the chat information on water filters um, from Because Health, which is part of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Uh, regrettable substitutes are, you know, we tell people not to use Roundup or glyphosate, and then they something else gets marketed that is as as dangerous or almost as dangerous as what that is what that is. So. Um, I, you know, there's really no, um, find products that are closest to, that have the fewest synthetic chemicals in them and that are closest to the ground. Did you want to add something there, Barb? Well, I just, uh, so you talked about BPA and BPA, um, there has been legislation around getting this phenyl A out of, for instance, children's products. And so what you will sometimes now see is uh, in their advertising, BPA free. But what they don't tell you is they put BPS in there. Well, you can say it's BPA free because it's got BPS. And so when people have begun to look at some of the toxicology, the toxicity associated with BPS, well, lo and behold, some of the same uh, health risks exist because the molecules are so similar, but they can call it BPA free. So those are, that's a specific example of a regrettable substitute and how the labeling can be totally misleading. And, and how the chemical industry is really behind it all. Right, right. So are there other questions? I just want everybody to know that the, the key things in the chat will be sent to you also along with the slides and the recordings. So, so you'll get all the links and suggested readings. And, um, and if you all as a collectivity, because obviously many of you are sort of leaning in here. Um, if you've got some suggestions, put them in the, in the chat and we'll share them with everybody. And so Catherine, thank you so very much. That was terrific. And also a terrific a conversation ensued um, uh, via the chat. I think people got a lot of their questions answered. Um, always good to do that. And um, 